and start up an e-conference. It's being live streamed. There we go. And so welcome back, everybody. And, uh, you know, it's every time we meet again for one of these, we it's like, you know what? We met on March 20th last year, 21 months ago, and we thought, hey, this will last a couple of weeks. Then we said that July 31st would be the last time we would have an e-conference. That was, of course, last year. Um, we met in December. We met earlier this year on the one year anniversary. We thought if you were Adam Thans, for example, you planned the 2020 you'd invite people to your beautiful planetarium. And that didn't happen. So let's invite him in 21. And then that didn't happen. And then Adam got so pissed off by it, he said, forget 22, we're going all the way to 23. And so this is just a microcosm of all of the things that we've been feeling for the last, uh, for the last 21 months. And I have to say, it is wonderful to see all of you. Um, it is good to be back home in this setting uh and those of you that were able to make it out to um GLPA or you were down in South America for APAS or you were able to be uh in France for APLF it's like those little teases of of seeing other people in person and getting to be in planetarium domes like hopefully we continue with that I know there's we've got um the American Astronomical Society is coming up at the beginning of January and good chance we'll see some of you there. Very exciting. But also, this has been an incredible learning experience and it is like we were scared the first time we did this and now we're just frustrated, but at least in the middle, we've been resilient and just commend all of you for that. And, you know, it's been a long year. We still have, of course, two weeks, so we don't want to get too much ahead of ourselves. But at the very least, um, hey, let's take some time to be able to enjoy each other's company and talk about how the year has gone and what we have to look forward to in 22, uh, as well as a fair number of recurring segments, like all of the things you've loved for the last two years. We've brought quite a bit of them back. So we've got a few uh, uh, opening segments. Uh, Ken Brant's with us, Sarah Schultz. Um, Renee and the big astronomy team have an update. Um, I saw Tiffany and Shannon popped in, so great. So the the big astronomy team is all here. And then, of course, we've got long German words of 2021 with Anna Green, who is not in Germany right now. She is in the States and, is, and as such uh, is on, I think, a fairly decent time for this. So thank you, Anna. Um, Justin Bartle's back with Totally Bored. Mike Smale's got the record shop. We're talking about podcasts with Mary Holt. And then I think what might be the most emotional part of all of this, Renee and best parts of 2021 there at the end. So we want to, as always, end on a high note. But uh, enough of me talking. Let's get to the e-conference. Uh, starting off today uh, with a Perseverance update. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Brandt. And guest, uh, ooh, Dr. Sarah, is it Sarah Marcotte? Yes, Sarah Marcotte. Yes, so Ken Brandt, Not Sarah Marcotte. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been doctoring people all morning. <laughs> um, every, every, everybody, you've just been upgraded one step in your nice. education. So good job, everybody. But Ken and Sarah, take it away. Okay, hang on one second, guys. I've got a little technical issue I'm trying to solve here. Okay. It's because of that mistletoe, Ken. That's the mistletoe. It's always the mistletoe. Blame the mistletoe. All right. So uh, let's see. I want to do this right here. Go to that window. Are you guys seeing what looks like a PowerPoint? That is correct. Very good. All right. So slideshow. Where's the slideshow button? Dang it all. Ah. Under Up view. Right. Okay. Under view. Okay. Yeah. View Thank show. you. View show. View show. Here we go. Okay. All right, got it. Okay, good. All right, so you guys, um, I rechristened the uh, mobile machines on Mars as Mars motion machines <laughs> because, you know, it's getting confusing. You've got rovers, you've got solar powered rovers, nuclear powered rovers, solar powered rovers, and now you got a helicopter. So it's getting complicated here. 
But we're going to be talking today about the three U.S. ones that are currently operating and, and working beautifully on Mars. Um, of course, Perseverance, Curiosity, and Ingenuity. And um, I have, I've wrangled a guest speaker, and perhaps the best one I possibly could have gotten for this. Uh, Sarah Marcotte is the lead uh, for Mars Engagement at JPL. And she's the person to talk to you about Mars resources of any stripe. And she'll talk more about that as we get into this. Um, so there's that stuff there, title slide. That beautiful panorama that uh, the Curiosity team released about a week ago. Uh, they call it Sunrise Sunset. And there was two different images, or two different sets of images taken around sunrise. That's the orange lighting, I think. And sunset, and that's the kind of bluish lighting on the right. So orange and blue yay go gators okay I had to get that in there oh okay come on advance the slide there we go okay so sarah take it away all right thanks ken so um any of the updates i was going to give you probably already know uh but ken suggested uh, you know are there some great resources that can be useful in museums and planetariums so i picked out some of our, my favorites that um, allow you to tap into really exactly what the rovers and the helicopter are doing now. And just to give one little shout out to a working spacecraft on Mars that is not in perpetual motion, the InSight lander. Um, that InSight lander is still collecting data um, in Elysium Planitia, uh, thousand souls in. So um, it's still doing its thing. So even though some of them are in perpetual motion, Insight is uh, not in perpetual motion, but is collecting data and still doing its thing. So I just wanted to um, show you a few of these resources for um, curiosity and perseverance that allow you to tap into, you know, sort of exactly what the rover is doing. Um, when we, you know, we have connected with mission teams in the public engagement team, and on our website, um, raw images come down daily and locations for both of the rovers come down as soon as the mission team sees them, they go directly onto our public website. So for Curiosity Rover, the, the location map is updated every time Curiosity drives. So you always can see how far it's gone and um, where it is in Gale Crater. Um, it is now climbing, she, it is now climbing up the side of Mount Sharp, which was um, sort of an end goal of this mission was to explore the floor of Gale Crater and then uh, start going up the sides of Mount Sharp to a transition where the environment of Mars um, is sort of the, a change in environment of Mars is recorded on the side of Mount Sharp from a very friendly um, sort of neutral uh, lake that used to be in Gale Crater to sort of a drier, more acidic environment. That transition is recorded on the side of Mount Sharp. So Curiosity is exploring that transition now. So the location map updated every time Curiosity drives. Explore with Curiosity is sort of takes that location map. It's a 3D model of the rover in situ in Gale Crater with actual location, you know, sort of mesh maps and data around it. So it's really looking like where it is in Gale Crater. And any of the raw images it's taken, you know, in the days prior are populated on this site. So you can see exactly the most recent images from various cameras on the rover, whichever ones it used. So um, the Explorer with Curiosity is a nice thing, you know, to, to sort of demo, you know, can't stretch it for a dome, but could certainly, you know, show it on one part of the dome. Um, where's the rover today? How far has it gone? It's such a common question, you know, how far has it driven? Um, we do put out a lot of panoramas for um, Curiosity, and I know a lot of you have the ability to um, stretch those big and, and you know, make them um, feel 360. So there's a lot of um, good images that you can throw up on the dome and uh, to the delight of all. And, you know, of course, Gale Crater does look like New Mexico. Um, and, you know, the mission team is periodically writing updates, if not every week, then every 10 days or so on, um, you know, where they're going, what they've done, what they've found, what their plans are. Next slide, Ken. All right, perseverance. Uh, this is going to kind of mirror what we have for Curiosity. So Curiosity was a great test case to have everything we needed um, ready to go when Perseverance landed. So we do now have um, a, a location map for uh, Perseverance as well, updated every time the rover drives. You can always see where the rover is and the helicopter. 
Um, if you've been following the helicopter, you know that we we tried to really manage expectations for that helicopter. We tried to um, just, you know, just say it was going to, you know, do a couple of flights, maybe five. It was maybe going to go three meters up in the air. Maybe it would fly for 90 seconds. That would be it. Well, we just passed flight number 18 <laughs> and um, on Sol 269 or something. So that little guy is still going. So we've added that to the location map. And um, you can see, I don't need to go through all of these, but um, the Explore with Perseverance um, experience on our website is the same thing. It's a 3D model and all the raw, recent raw images it's taken populate an environment. So you can see where it is and uh, what it's looking at and then see the raw images from various cameras that are on the screen. The uh, mission team is also doing updates for Perseverance and they've taken a very different um, kind of approach to their updates, which is really fun and making me very happy that, um, you know, as opposed to just sort of listing, like, here's, here's what we did, what we found, here's what we're going to do. They sort of take a different angle of, you know, from my perspective, I work on the cameras. And let me tell you a little bit about the cameras and, you know, what we did last week with the cameras. Then someone else will, you know, do a very personal spin on what they do on the mission and a different little angle. So rather than kind of a record of what they've done, it's kind of, it's a little more personal and different aspects of the rover and operations and the mission. So it's a fun, fun option. Gives you more of a window into the people that drive these things. And um, we do have the raw images. As soon as they come down from Perseverance, they land on our website from many of the cameras and also um, Ingenuity's cameras. And they're in white balance and kind of raw form when they come in. So any day of the week, you can see you know, whatever images have come in most recently, and members of the public can vote for their favorite. And then every week, the, you know, favorite image as voted on by the public uh, goes up in a gallery on our site. A lot of fun where you could say, you know, whose birthday is today? Okay. Or whose birthday was last week, and then find some raw images taken on Mars for someone's birthday or something. And uh, next slide, Ken. Come on, push it on through, push it on You're through. You're muted, Ken. He's over there screaming, I guess. I can see his little cursor dashing around. I don't even know what the next slide is. I think I might've just have a few more resources. Let me tell you what um, was announced at the American Geophysical Union this week. You may have seen information on our website. We put out a release. Uh, Perseverance's team has um, I'm going to go right to this little Perseverance update, um, has released some information about what they know about Jezero Crater. They believe that Jezero Crater, um, the floor of the crater where Perseverance has been exploring is, um, you know, it was formed by slowly cooling magma. Was it buried and was a magma sort of chamber? Um, but they're finding lots of crystalline rocks, uh, olivine, pyroxene, um, and small little crystals that have Grown in, you know, grown in situ, and uh, it tells them that the floor, this was not a surprise, the floor of that crater is of volcanic origin and um, was magma at some point. Um, and they don't know if it was you know, buried and then exposed. They were wondering if the floor of that crater was going to be um, sedimentary rock carried down from a channel and the lake that filled that crater. So they do know that the, the bedrock there is of volcanic origin. They have found organics, so they do not know the nature of these organics, but they have found um, organic compounds in, in their rocks. Cannot be answered whether they are biogenic or have been created by chemical reactions in the rocks. So um, two exciting things about that. They've taken, um, they've filled six sample tubes, four with rock samples from two targets, so they're taking two samples of two targets and um, several are atmospheric samples and something called a witness tube, which is uh, an effort to periodically seal an empty tube. And then if there is any contamination on the rock samples, it would also show up in this tube and they could give get an idea if they're getting organic readings, if there's contamination in the tubes. These tubes were awfully clean so there shouldn't be any contamination in them. But as we know, um, microbes are fierce little things and they'll attach to anything. So um, contamination could have come from Earth to Mars. Um, 
here is a nice planetarium uh, show that developed by uh, Jeff Nee. I'm sure many of you know him at JPL. Um, wonderful resource for um, you know all things Mars. And I did have some uh, Ingenuity resources as well. Ken had some links there. Um, but Ingenuity, I mean, it keeps going. <laughs> Again, we were expecting five flights and now we've completed 18 and it is in kind of an operations and a scouting mode. So that's exciting because um, that was not part of the plan. And it was nice that they could pivot to actually doing some useful scouting work with the helicopter as opposed to, let's just see if this thing flies. So yeah. it definitely does fly and it has been useful to uh, look ahead for the rover and help govern some of the driving decisions that they made. And there's a one thing that's really neat, especially if you know pilots, is they do a flight log every day, you know, every time it flies. And so they tell you exactly how long each flight is, how far it went, you know, where it is in Jezero. So the flight log, I think, is is a lot of fun because it's, it's very handy. Then you always have all the data about those flights. And uh, some people, I think, are trying to recreate the flights uh, with drones, which I think would be a lot of fun. And that's what I got. Okay, I wanted to come back to this link real quick in the bottom, the new pan you've got to see. Yeah, um, I didn't put that in. That's, that's going to be very, um, that's going to be very nice for those of you able to warp images into your dome. Uh, that's that's going to be a very, very nice 360. It's beautiful. It takes about a minute to run and it goes all the way around on um, on the floor of Jezero Crater. So you can see the rim of the crater, you see where the delta is. Oh, that's the one we just put out yesterday? Yeah. So the day before? Okay. Yeah, the day before. The, the new one. pan. You Gotta see. Yeah, that's a beauty. That's a beauty. Yeah. And um, there's another page here, Sarah, for. Um, oh, great. Yep. You know, links. About good stuff. Take those links. That's, you know, um, I'm not the Mars Public Engagement lead, but I am one of the specialists. Oh, and um, this is, you know, resources we have on our website. And I am always available um, when people shoot me an email if you need, you know, a speaker for, you know, plan, you know, some sort of show at your planetarium or museum. Or um, if you need ideas for activities, um, you know, we have downloadable materials and 3D models uh, available various places. Um, I'm always, you know, happy to help uh, museum partners and planetarium partners. These are just a few links, but I love kind of, I know these websites inside and out. Sometimes it is hard to find what you're looking for and I can help dig for it and uh, get you what you need. Yeah, and if you're not already a member of the Museum Alliance, what are you doing? I don't no, know what are you doing? doing. Oh, because what 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 are you even thinking? Um, <laughs> definitely have stuff to is be there. a part of this stuff because it's all free. Um, and, you know there are trainings that happen weekly or biweekly to get you up to speed on all the latest that JPL and NASA are doing. Um, there's uh, I think an, another one coming up about Artemis next week or sometime soon. What um, happened this week on Artemis? I think yeah, it's you know, all about James Webb right now. So I'm sure everybody is on their Christmas Eve going to be. Yeah, watching that James Webb launch. I, I forget what time it is. Some ridiculous hour. Yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, Santa's got to watch out because you know, <laughs> rocket will go right by him. <laughs> <laughs> that could fly right through the reindeer. You know? ah! Ah. <laughs> reindeer on the Barbie, you know. So, um, so I think that's basically it, you guys. Does anybody yeah. have any questions for Sarah or me? But Sarah's probably going to be able to answer them intelligently and then i'll jump off okay all right um, I guess hey, real, real quick before sarah runs um i just wanted to say uh thank you to her and second what ken said about join the museum alliance uh sarah was a huge help to me in planning our mars exhibit in berlin thank you sarah i really appreciate it <gasps> but a face Anna, I, it was not putting those two together oh I hope yeah I so and I owe you a goes. copy of um, the uh, Seven Minutes of Terror with German um, subtitles. Oh, great idea. Yeah. So I will send that your way when I get back to Berlin. So neat. But yeah, definitely join. Uh, and Sarah is phenomenal. So helpful. So. And Michael, is now a good time to talk about my good news or should I wait for later? We will keep that as part of the good news. <gasps> oh. I'll do that. Oh, yes. get, get people waiting. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Nice to see you and um, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ken. And then, Ken, I'll have you 
stop sharing. There we go. Perfect. All right. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Dr. Sarah Schultz. You may know her from IPS or Glippa or Lips or Live from the Planetarium Part 1. And here's Sarah to talk about Live from the Planetarium Part 2. Sarah, take it away. Hello. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you. Good to be here. Um, let me see if I can share this screen real quick. And oh, no, that's not what I want to do. Ah, back up, back up. I think that if I do this first, then it will. Nope, now I can't find my, sorry, I should have practiced this in advance. And by now I should have had this figured out, but there we go. Seems like it always changes. All right, are you seeing the slide? Yes, good. Okay, so yes, hello, and um, thanks for being here. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes. It's gonna be a really short um, presentation, I guess, um, to tell you all about Live from the Planetarium, the sequel. So there was a Live from the Planetarium part one, and that was done, it was a project done by Glippa a few years back. And um, the idea was basically to record uh, or have planetariums, planetarians record themselves presenting live and get little snippets of um, tips and tricks and best practices uh, to share with the community so we can learn from each other. Uh, the, I, I'm sure we all know that the best way that we learn um, how to be better presenters is by watching other people present and getting ideas from our colleagues. And so the idea was to kind of reboot this and um, do another uh, version or do a second, a follow up so that we can expand on the topics and maybe update some things and maybe just reach a larger audience. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to give you a little bit of a clip here. You might recognize some of these faces in this video. Um, I'm hoping that the audio is going to be okay. I'm going to crank up my computer here and um, let me know if this doesn't work. Next up, we're going to watch April go back in time Good. at the Star Machine when an audience member asked to see something that's already said. There's a big square that makes Pegasus. Actually, I'm going to back up here. This is not what you're going to see out in the real sky. This is the Earth rotating backwards for a second so that we can get Pegasus the flying horse. See his big wing over here? Oh, I see it. Okay, and then there's her front legs, and there's a head. I like the way how April states that she's going to move the sky backwards so she doesn't confuse her audience. Mm -hmm, definitely. Next up, we're going to see Michael move the sky forward to get the moon in the right place. Mm -hmm. And notice how he doesn't get flustered and he's transparent about what he's doing. Yeah, it turns out if you were to go outside this evening, um, it looks like my star machine has maybe done something a little weird. It has put the moon in a position for last night. So this is the first time, just, this is just my excuse to show you how quickly the moon moves from one night to the next. Just keep your eyes on the moon from one night to the next night. That's about how much it's going to move. I love the way he used that little glitch with the moon as a teaching moment. We have to work through those glitches. We do. So that's a very small clip um, from the full video, and you can find that on the GLPA website. And I think I have a link in here somewhere. I know it's tough to Next get, up. Whoops, get links from um, a PowerPoint on you know Zoom. But um, the idea is that we need all of you to participate. We need people to be willing to record themselves and allow others to watch that. And so the idea is this is basically a request for volunteers who are willing to record presentations and or if it's part of a presentation, whatever it is that you're comfortable with. Um, and I'll allow others to be able to view that. So submit that so that we can include it in this um, this video, and it might be a video series, it might be a one video, we'll see, it depends on how many people volunteer. So of course, there are benefits to recording. 
Um, there's benefits to your self recording. So you kind of, you know, self reflection and looking at how you present and maybe changing things that you don't like about the way you present or, you know, really focusing on the things that you do like, um, being able to share that with your, um, your staff and the people at your institution, but also sharing it across the board and sharing it with others. Um, and you can learn from other people as well. When I was um, listening to recordings for my dissertation, the I learned so much about how other people present and it's amazing. All of the content is very similar, but there are very different approaches and some things might work really well for your um, institution, for your facility. Um, some things might work not so well, but you know, we can really learn from each other and together, you know, when we're all good, we're all good, right? um rising level floats all boats or whatever it is however that goes i don't even know that that phrase but anyway so we're right here thank you robin for laughing at me i appreciate that i can see you up in the corner here um so obviously this is a long gonna be a long process we're right at the beginning um and so we're just trying to get the word out to as many people as possible to see if people are interested a rising tide raises all boats thank you rt reverend ken brand i don't know what the rt is it retired I don't know. Um, Ken Brand, thank everyone. Thank you. <laughs> right, Reverend. Ah, very good. So we are just trying to get the word out, trying to get people involved um, and interested and see if this is something of interest to all of you. I am going to assume that it is, but if it isn't, then certainly, you know, it's good to know that too. So we don't expend resources and time on this. Um, but we just need to find out who's willing to try. And um, then we'll go forward. And I say we, because I'm not doing this alone. I've got uh, several people who have already volunteered to help. And um, we've got Tiffany and Jeff in here already. Um, Jeff was a part of the original um, program. And um, Tiffany is willing to help out as well. And they're, they're both in there. There's a couple other people who have volunteered as well. Um, so if there's any part of this process that you might be interested in helping with, um, be sure to let us know, because even if you're maybe um, outside of a dome or maybe you're not interested in recording or you can't record for some reason, but you have some skills that you think might be useful, that's useful as well. Um, so then here is the link for um, the live from the planetarium. And I think it might have, I don't know if anybody put that in the chat or not. Um, but also in order to kind of get a feel for um, interest level and maybe hurdles that people might have, um, I created some jam boards. So you can use this QR code to take you to the jam boards and you can submit comments because they're still live. Um, and so there's, I think, three jam boards with different questions. And so you could just go ahead and put some comments or questions that you might have um, there. And then um, once I give you just a minute or two more for the QR code, I'm going to move on and give you the QR code to sign up because that is the most important thing. Yes, jazz hands. Yes, sign up. Please sign up to be willing to share your expertise. Um, you never know who might learn from you and um, it's very valuable experience. So moving on to my final slide. This is the most important one. Please sign up, be willing. And if even if you're not sure um, if you can do it, if you're interested, if you have any interest at all, um, please sign up and we will be in contact with you in the future. We haven't really gotten too far down the road yet. It's still kind of feeling things out. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, you can be sure to reach out to me if you'd like. Otherwise, um, Tiffany, thank you, Tiffany, for putting that in the that link in the chat. Um, you can reach out to Tiffany or Jeff or me, and um, we can let you know what what we can do to help you. And we kind of need to know what what it is that you need help with, so that we can do the best we can with this um, project. So I'm gonna hmm, I'll leave this up for just a more minute or two. But Jeff and Tiffany, if you have anything that you'd like to share, I can shut up for a minute here. Nothing for me. I'm eating soup, so I've had my camera off, but uh, <laughs> nice job, Sarah. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks. Yeah, so um, be sure to check out the, the original. 
it's very useful um, and we're hoping that this will be just as useful. Um, most people have been asking me, well, what about this? Can I send this or can I do this or whatever? Yes, my answer is always yes, just do it. Um, if it doesn't end up being used, well, you've still done it and it's still useful. Um, my hope is that this will not just be um, a single video, but maybe like a catalog of videos or maybe some different topics in like, you know, I don't know, I, I imagine like this giant Google folder or something where, oh, I want to figure out how to present this part and you go to that folder and then there's like 16 videos of what you, I don't know, I'm thinking big, but um, the bigger the better, right? The more we can learn because it's not easy to get out to visit people, um, especially now, but we can learn from each other. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and now onto our next segment uh, from the Big Astronomy Project, Renee Kerrigan. And Renee, uh, if, if Tiffany and Shannon are actively part of this presentation, I'll let you introduce them as well again. Okay. Uh, you might be overselling me, Michael, because it's not really a presentation that I'm giving right now. Um, but uh, hi, everyone. I'm Renee Kerrigan. I know a lot of you. I'm at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, and I'm also part of the Big Astronomy Project. Big Astronomy is um, a free, a, a, a big project, but we have a free show uh, that you can get at bigastronomy.org, um, as well as a lot of other things. And we, the, the only thing I really wanted to mention um, to everyone today um, is that we have an opportunity to do uh, a, an event um, with Dr. Cyan Proctor, who, um, as probably uh, you all know, uh, went to space with the inspiration for mission um, just a couple of months ago. And Cyan is an ASEP ambassador. So on the second, second trip to Chile for, with the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassador Program um, in 2016, um, Cyan went to Chile. So she's a part of this larger program that um, Big Astronomy evolved out of. Uh, Shannon, Tiffany, and I are all ASAP ambassadors as well. So um, we are going to be doing a, a live event, like uh, somewhat similar to the live events that we've done for Big Astronomy um, before, um, that we're hoping to make it a little better or easier for planetarians to uh, use this event uh, in their dome, if they're interested. So um, we'll be sharing details soon, but the, the plan is to um, have an interview with Cyan, just talking about uh, her background. So the, one of the major goals of the Big Astronomy Project is to help uh, people and children understand that STEM professionals are whole people who have lives outside of their jobs and that um, have interests uh, and um, you know hobbies and families and all the things that make a person a real whole person. Um, and, and the goal of helping people understand that is then hopefully children or even adults will understand that you know anybody can do science. So we'll be asking Cyan about her background, about her many various careers that she's um, had in her life and um, how all of her experiences led up uh, in some ways to her going to space with the inspiration for mission um, and also a little bit about her life outside of her career, her hobbies and all those things. Um, and I plan on having an event with um, people in my dome so that we'll be able to ask uh, live questions from the audience. And also we invite you any other planetarians to have people in their own dome and be able um, to share the video on their screen. And if I know in advance that you are going to have people in your dome, I'll make it um, so that your dome can uh, ask questions as well. So um, the event is scheduled for February 4th. I just sent Cyan an email asking her if we can maybe move the time uh, to a little bit later to try to uh, reach more people because it was going to be during the day, but I'm going to see if we can move it to the early evening so the kids will be out of school. Um, 
and we'll be sharing more details on the dome uh, on the big astronomy Facebook page and sending out an email if you get our emails and Michael um, has offered to help share it and dome dialogues as well but that's just sort of a, um, a heads up that we're working on it and we would love for the event to be helpful and useful um, to other planetariums as well so if you have suggestions for how it could be um, more useful to you I welcome you to send me a quick email as well, uh, and I'll put my email in the chat. Awesome, thank you so much, Renee. Uh, and that gets us to sort of the, the main event for today's e-conference, and that's, it's been a long year. We said that last year. Oh, Renee, something again, go ahead. I just remembered that um, we're closing it out with uh, best parts of the year, which uh, Michael is kindly letting me sort of lead, um, but, uh, if you want, are thinking of like a best part of your year, maybe it's personal rather than professional, and you have an image that you want to share related to that, be thinking of it earlier, and then we'll let you share your screen at the end. So I just wanted to get it in there uh, before too much time has passed so people can find their picture if they want to. Excellent. Yeah. And then like, if anything, that can be the, the differentiator that this part is more about like professionally what's happened for you in 21 the good and maybe the not so good uh and that best parts is is a little bit more personal the things that, that have happened to you this year and family and otherwise uh that have really kind of made your 21 bearable uh, so now we get to turn it over to all of you um as we usually do you can electronically raise your hand uh and then cues you right up and we can let everybody uh speak but how has 21 been for all of you? And what are you looking forward to in 2022 to, uh, to you know, some, some good things, I think, on the horizon? Uh, let's start off with um, the blessed Steve Crawford. Sure. Uh, so uh, 20, 2021, uh, we Obviously, uh, we opened here at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, we were able to also, uh, this summer, uh, we upgraded to Digistar 7. Uh, so that's uh, been nice from previously we had uh, Digistar 6. So it's not, a, not an enormous upgrade, uh, not, a, not a huge difference. We didn't get new projectors and things like that. It was just software upgrade, but it, uh, we've been enjoying it. And then uh, the biggest thing that we did uh, was to host uh, the Great Lakes Planetarium Association Conference, uh, which was a lot of work uh, for me and for Mark Reed, uh, my colleague, and then other people here at uh, our museum. And uh, it was very challenging with the capacity restrictions we still have in place. We are we're open and we're uh, having public shows uh, just on Fridays and Saturdays, um, but we are still limited to having 27 people in a dome that we normally have 110. Um, uh, and those restrictions were in place still for the conference as well, which was, was very difficult. But that said, it was, a, I think, a great conference. I, I got to see some of it. Uh, I was a little busy, but... Um, it was great to have Absolutely. people here um, in in meet in person. So that's that's what's been going on for us. Thank you, Steve. And yeah, it was a fantastic conference. So like, huge round of applause for a, an amazing body of work. Thaddeus, go ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so. My big news is that uh, last month I became the director of a planetarium. Um, I accepted a position as director of education and visitor experiences for the Avampado Discovery Museum and Caperton Planetarium in uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And I've got uh, experience as a planetarium presenter uh, from having worked at COSI previously. And 
the kind of the big thing for 2022 is going to be starting live shows again. The museum is is open and we're welcoming in guests. We've completely overhauled our ventilation system to help make it safe for everyone. Um, trying to have other, you know, masking protocols and like in there as well, of course. Um, but when I came on board, um, the CEO of the whole organization is the only one besides myself that has kind of planetarium presentation experience. And so we're looking to hire a new full-time planetarium presenter and educator to help develop, present shows and train people. And uh, we're working on the, the wording for that, um, but I'm definitely gonna be advertising that position soon and look forward to working with them to help get uh, live star shows in the building again on a regular basis. So I'm gonna start by just doing a few myself for uh, school field trips uh, next month. Excellent. Well, welcome to the, to, I think this is first e-conference for you. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been on the Facebook group a little bit uh, when I started being a presenter at COSI, um, but I've not been very heavily immersed in the community. Hopefully that'll. <laughs> well, we're going to fix that. <laughs> yeah. We're going to fix that in some really big ways. Shannon, go ahead. like which one am i doing my videos on um sorry i i had somebody pop into my office um so we're talking about professional stuff right um so i think uh one of the highlights of 2021 for us is it, it literally just happened last weekend but we opened our uh meteorite exhibit so we've been working on this for like ever <laughs> um, um hi Raylena. um so this is something we we applied for a grant like four or five years ago and then it had a delay and then it had another delay and now we're done um so this is a um our collection hasn't been on display for years and so uh, almost 30 years at this point and so it's nice to have it on but one of the really nice things is it has a moon mars and vestin meteorite for people to touch and it's got um a complete collection of michigan meteorites because we really wanted people to connect with um space through their own home state with like where what we have found here so uh we've just opened it so i guess in 2022, I'm looking forward to seeing more people come through. Um, we're also going to be having MSU classes back in our dome, which we haven't had for a few years. And I'll be teaching again for the first time in a few years. So um, I think we're slowly getting back to where we used to be. And so um, still been, a, it's been rough this past year. There's been a lot going on, but I think these are the, the highlights that I'm kind of remembering or were good this year, so. Awesome, thank you, Shannon. Anna Green, not the not the last time you'll hear from Anna today. Hey, yeah. So, um, twenty twenty one's actually been a pretty big year for for me and the Stiftung Planetarium Berlin. So, first of all, most of you know we won the bid to host IPS twenty twenty four. We will be co hosting with uh, Jena. Uh, however, Heilbronn is not out of the picture because they will be one of the post conference tours. So. All of the bidders will have some part of the conference. Um, and I really hope that you'll all be able to make it. There will be stipends available. There will be at least 12 available uh, as of right now. So um, if you have any concerns about being able to afford to go, um, when that information is available, I'll make sure it's widely, widely seen. Dome Dialogues, IPS everywhere. Um, and on the IPS front, I also just was elected as one of the board members representing Europe. So um, for, I think, the one other European on this call, Colin, um, <laughs> if you have anything that you would like me to take to the board or to the officers or anything like that, any ideas, any concerns, please let me know. Super happy to do that. Um, otherwise, in regards to Berlin, uh, oh, thanks, Ryan. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, with, uh, regards to the Shipton Planetary Rebellion, we got to host, uh, part of Best of Earth and, uh, do the award show. And, um, I'm very excited because I've been more involved with the Aschenholz Observatory, which is our 125 year old observatory. It's uh, the oldest one of our sites in Berlin. 
Um, and so I have now been doing shows in our small planetarium, which I've absolutely fallen in love with. It's so tiny and cute and wonderful. Um, and then also I am slowly getting taught how to drive the 21 meter refractor, which is awesome. So it's 125 years old. It has motors and all that, um, and no safety stops. So if you don't stop it in time, it will destroy the building. So that's why I don't get to drive it by myself right now. But one day, one day I will, uh, hopefully well before 2024, so I can give you all a tour of one of my favorites of our facility. Well, I love all our facilities, so that's not really fair, but yeah. So um, yeah, anyway, thanks all. And seeing all of you continually throughout the year too has of course been professionally wonderful and personally. Thank you, Anna. Tiffany, go ahead. It's great to see everyone. Um, I think the personal and professional highlight of, of my year was really getting to see a lot, many of you at Glippa. Um, Glippa is always a special conference, but it was especially so uh, this year. Um, and so thank you again, Steve and, and Mark and, and Renee and everyone that, everyone, the many, many people behind the scenes to uh, make that conference happen. Um, for 2021, I've, I've been trying to figure out my like career life. Uh, it's a common story with everyone. Uh, budgets get cut and jobs change. And um, I'm still in my planetarium dome part-time, but it's now part-time under soft money, whereas before it was full-time, um, you know, a, a, a position the university cut. Uh, but that's okay. I've also gotten a job now uh, part-time at Associated Universities Incorporated. They're um, a nonprofit that manages some of the large astronomical facilities. I'm on their education and public engagement team, and it's been so much fun. I feel like I'm growing tremendously as a professional, meeting many amazing people. So uh, 2021's turned out to be a, a pretty good year for me professionally, uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. Renee, go ahead. Um, well, a uh, big highlight for me this year was we finally got a hardware uh, and software update in our planetarium. Um, we had, we, the Peoria Riverfront Museum opened in 2012, um, but we were the Lakeview Museum of Arts and Sciences before that since 1963. And um, we had put in a Zeiss CKP4 and a power dome system in 2008. And we were still keeping that system going until this year. Uh, with with some upgrades and updates throughout the years, but the uh, power dome uh, or the the space gate projectors, we had five space gate projectors, and we were just sort of keeping them going as best we could. So it was um, really fantastic to get the hardware upgrade of um, new uh, projectors for our, our digital planetarium, um, and we kept our ICKP for so we have a little bit of the uh, the best of both worlds there, I think. Um, and we got the uh, Digistar 7 software. Um, so it's been really fun to and challenging to learn a whole new software system. Um, and we've created a couple live shows with it. And uh, we just put a JWST control panel up on the cloud. So if you're a Digistar user, you should check that out because I think it's pretty cool. Um, uh, so that was a, a big highlight professionally for um, 2021. And I will um, echo others that seeing a lot of uh, my colleagues and friends at the Glippa conference and uh, helping uh, in my role at, at, at Glippa as, um, to help plan it, but it was really, really rewarding since I know a lot of people share that they had a, a, a great time. Um, but huge, huge uh, props go to Steve Crawford and Mark Reed for all the work that they did and all the other members of the uh, team uh, that helped uh, make that conference come together, but it was really a highlight for me seeing everybody. I look forward to Glip all year uh, and finally got to see everyone. So that was fun. Awesome. Thank you, Renee. Sarah, go ahead. All right. So um, I'll be quick. I um, just a couple of weeks ago found out that I was awarded a NASA grant to do outreach to our local community. 
Um, and I'm very excited about it. I was actually pretty sure I didn't get it because <laughs> um, I hadn't heard anything. So I figured, oh, well, they're waiting till the very end to tell the people that eh, you didn't get it. Um, it's a pretty small grant, but um, we're planning on reaching out to the local libraries to, um, I'm in a meeting, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, to get view, NASA view space out to the local libraries. Um, and so we wanted to have um, little like media consoles in each of the libraries in our area. We have three cities that we kind of serve directly um, and then be able to create some content that will tie in with those um, those topics that they see on the, the monitor so they can we can bring people to the planetarium to our regional science center which also has an observatory and to our oceanarium which is a marine lab that we have on campus as well um so that's really uh exciting and i'm looking forward to that it's kind of one of my uh biggest like real grants that i've ever gotten um and uh, one thing that was very challenging this year was, and uh, um, like Renee, I had to learn new software. Our, um, for some reason, Uniview died on us for forever. So RIP uh, Uniview, um, it was kind of hobbling along, but it was working, but then all of a sudden it didn't. And so I had to, in the middle of the summer, we just had to switch gears and learn open space and Stellarium. Um, and so I've been learning a lot and I'm really grateful to, especially to Micah on the open space team who has helped me learn to do a lot of coding that I never thought I was going to have to do um, and getting more familiar and recreating shows and things like that. So that's been kind of a little bit of a triumph to really have to just drop something that I've been using for 10 years and then learn something new. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's been a good year and I'm looking forward to next year. Thank you, Sarah. Carol, go ahead. Our planetarium projector suddenly died right before a school show about a month, month and a half ago. Um, so we haven't been able to give planetarium shows ever since. Today, they're starting, yesterday, um, the projector arrived at um, T Reality, formerly Estraline in um, Xenia, Ohio. Um, and we don't know exactly what's wrong. They say either the light engine, I don't even know what that is, or um, a heat sensor capacitor or something. Um, but whatever that is, that also is over a thousand dollars. And um, they say that once they work on it, if we can't afford what ever the work is that we should have it back within a week. But of course it's FedEx holiday time. So I am suffering major planetarium withdrawal. I am stuck in the auditorium with nice activities, thank goodness for them, plus Stellarium skies. Um, days I'm off, none of the part-timers have learned Stellarium. So days that I'm off, I don't think they do anything other than hide and seek moon. And it's kind of depressing for me, but uh, hopefully I can get some camaraderie because maybe some of you have suffered similar fates. That's it. Thanks, Carol. But, and, and more importantly, thanks for like being here today and, and being here with us. It's meaningful sure. ryan moore go ahead awesome thank you so much michael um big big awesome uh kind of just exciting thing that happened in southern california this year is our first fully focused full dome film festival at uh actually scott mitchell's amazing orange coast college um Planetarium. We had an amazing turnout this year. So many incredible full dome film creators, so many incredible science films. And just planting a flag here in Los Angeles 
waking up the entertainment complex to the incredible work that's being done in the full dome industry. And, and yeah, Mike uh, McConville was there. Mike Smile was there. We had like a lot of great mics. I think we had a collection of some of the best mics. We, we were missing a few of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, just huge, huge thanks there. And then another really exciting thing was actually a, um, a indirect uh, product of the pandemic uh, because so many film festivals had to cancel last year. This year, a number of film festivals came together, Full Dome Film Festivals came together to produce the best of Earth Awards, something that we can really uh, collaborate on and, and champion the absolute best shows, the best work that's being done in the space. And we're really excited about continuing to grow that as things move forward. But really our, our excitement is just for championing creators, championing the people that are doing the amazing work um, and, and just promoting that. And a huge uh, thank you to Anna Green for being our presenter at the Berlin uh, Actual Awards reception and uh, doing an amazing job just, uh, uh, yeah, honoring the creators uh, and, and the people that are doing all the amazing hard work. Uh, excited about taking that all into 2022 with the, both Dome Fest West and Best of Earth, but super thankful and just um, really just honored uh, to, to be in the space and, and working with all of you. Thanks, Ryan. And yeah, uh, total shout out to Scott Mitchell, the Steve Crawford of California uh, for doing a fantastic job with Dome Fest West. Well done. All right. He's been waiting an hour and one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Brandt. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, permission to share my screen, please. All right, there it is. Hopefully you're seeing um, a lot of water and what used to be a planetarium there on your left-hand side. Uh, that was the planetarium shortly after Hurricane Matthew five and a half years ago. On the right-hand side, plans for the new one. And plans for the new one got a big boost, the most important part of the picture, the money. Um, the state legislature um, and the governor actually came together in North Carolina, which is something of a rarity these days, and passed a budget. Bravo to them. Uh, good job. And in that budget was a $5 million allocation to the public schools to rebuild the Planetarium Science Center. Now, most of you know $5 million is not going to cut it. But my superintendent has also submitted a request for $50 million for construction of a new technology high school. And inside that technology high school will be a Planetarium and Science Center. And one of the things I, I, you know, I've been listening to people talk about the possibilities of this for five and a half years, as you might guess. And Carol, I feel exactly what you're going through. If you want to talk, give me a call or shoot me an email because I know exactly what it's like to be ripped out from under your dome. Um, I get it, 100%. Not, not something you want to go through by yourself. That's for sure. Um, anyway, but to get back to this, the other good piece of good news is we actually started having kids back in the inflatable. And I've been very cautious, got an air purifier that pur supposedly purifies the air in that space five times a minute. Um, I find that hard to believe, but it's still purifying air and sterilizing the air before it comes out, courtesy UV. And um, we've been able to run summer camp programs. We had to pause for a month or so because of Delta. And we may have another pause here in January because of Omicron or whatever. But, you know, but the bottom line is we're having kids come to visit Planetarium and a Science Center again. I, up until this year, I didn't have a Science Center because I was in this one little room that was basically planetarium sized. And I'm so grateful for that organization and all that time. They, they gave that room to us for free, uh, the public schools. So it was really nice. But, um, you know, just we have actual money and we have a targeted plan by March of next year. We will know for sure what the status is on that one pot of money the superintendent has requested. And also a FEMA arbitration comes to a head at the end of February. And that could get another 80 million or so for the school district after Matthew, because a lot of stuff was damaged and FEMA offered the school district, we requested 88 million, they offered five. And so we hired some lawyers and we were lawyered up and went, went at them. And the guy who's running that law firm in Washington, DC, former head of FEMA. <laughs> so if anybody knows how that how the monkey the monkey the wrench there, he's gonna know. And um, so I'm pretty confident we're gonna have a whole crap load of money here in the spring. 
And with some of that, they're going to build the Planetarium and Science Center, basically how I want it. A lot of people have been working really hard on this project, including Tim Berry. You might know him from the um, Operations and Design Committee. Um, he's working with me pro bono to do site designs and work with the architects here in North Carolina. And he has been instrumental. Next time you see him, just pat him on the back and say, hey, Ken says thanks. <laughs> because without him, none of this would have happened. So, um, so that's my good news. Um, I hope you all have the greatest of holidays. And I'm going to figure out how to meet myself here. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ken, if you can uh, unshare your screen as well, that would be wonderful. There we go. All right, so congratulations, Ken. And then you're going to need a new name because then the Phoenix is alive and, like, move on to the Griffin or something. Um, Adam Thans, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Adam Thans from the Bayes Mountain Planetarium in uh, Kingsport, Tennessee. And you probably already know, but I'll just throw it out here. This last year, we finally got the replacement for our uh, digital projectors. So, and also a um, kind of an upgrade and general maintenance of our star projector. So at this point, um, we, we have a 40 foot dome, but we have a Zeiss ZKP4 star projector with LED stars now, uh, which look great. Um, also our digital projectors, which uh, is akin to um, what was discussed earlier, uh, that uh, they were the space gate uh, Quintos, that they were dying, they were just too old. And so now we have six velvet LED projectors and um, they, they are really, really good. I'll just kind of stop there. So you all are welcome to come and visit and see, uh, but we're really enjoying just the image quality on the dome and still learning the system. There's so many, pieces and parts of the software and everything to learn, but um, we are enjoying that. Um, and also, uh, which is, is more, you know, that, that I appreciate almost even more is that we have, because of the pandemic, we had lost one of our interns because she needed money to work uh, and make money. So um, we have a new intern that started uh, this last spring and uh, her name is uh, uh, Callie Walker. And um, she, she's, she's a high school student, but she's gonna be going to college locally. And she's really into, into astronomy and learning a lot, and, uh, really learning those presentation skills. So uh, uh, Sarah, you know, we understand how important it is for the, the presentation quality and misconceptions and understanding what you're saying and how people perceive that. So, um, I'll, I'll stop there with our little bit of news. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And of course, should always be said, thank you for uh, being our host site in 23 for the, the next national conference here in the US. So really, yeah. really excited for that. An amazing kickoff to the centennial, let's just say. Let's yes, just and say. it's gonna be fun. I'll, I'll just start out there. It's mid June, uh, the official dates are, you know, they are set. It's like the third week of June. And um, I even just a few days ago got another potential request for a workshop slot. So if you're interested in an educational sharing, make and take something kind of a workshop for 23, let me know. Thank you. All right. Colin, go ahead. Thanks, Michael. Uh, well, it's been quite a busy year uh, here at Think Tank. We managed to reopen in June. Uh, to public originally 16, we're now back up at full capacity, managed to write a couple of shows and started our Leeds program again. So it's uh, sell out shows every every month so far. So it's been pretty good here. Um, there's a few other things that have been happening. I, I mean, I've been showcased as one of the STEM career. But, uh, we've got a gallery uh, showcasing STEM careers. Uh, 14 people and the planetarium and myself have been showcased for that. So, so I've got my uh, almost life-size image on one of our galleries, so it's quite scary seeing it. But um, one of the other projects I'm on, involved with in is uh, a new planetarium um, slightly north of here. I mentioned it in Dome Dialogues already. 
uh, where we managed to get a slick of money, about two and a, two and a half, two and a quarter million pounds from the government, uh, which has allowed us to start designing the design stage of the planetarium, which hopefully, if we keep up the momentum, will result in construction starting in about a year and a half, two years time. So that's that's been some excellent news. And the best news recently, uh, 1st of December, I have been given promotion and I am now the planetarium lead, uh, officially managing the planetarium. So it was a ni nice way to end, end the year. And next year is going to hold. Thank you, Colin. And I don't want to American explain you, but you did forget one thing about yourself this year. Uh, Colin is now the president elect of the Digistar Users Group. Um, and like, like me, we ran amazing races uh, and we won unanimously. And that's all you need to know it was just landslide victories. So, congratulations, Colin. Yeah, there was that just that one little piece I forgot to mention. Just a little. Holy Atta, go the ahead. Part of trying to take over the universe. Thank you. Um, for those that do not know me, uh, I'm Julieta. I work for many years at the Adler Planetarium as Associate Director of the Space Visualization Laboratory there. And uh, then I worked in Hawaii for a year. Um, and then I started working on a project in my own town when I came back uh, about trash. And this year I was invited by the Guild of National natural science illustrators to be one of their keynotes in their conference, which of course was on Zoom. But uh, that was uh, a really good thing. Uh, I'm very grateful for that uh, to showcase that we need to connect to data, especially data that kind of hurts a little, you know, the garbage, especially plastic garbage in which we're swimming right now. So very grateful for that and i also uh, i have been part of the I, I have been sitting in the board of uh, an advisory board of immersa for a few years and this year i became part of the board of directors i'm very grateful for that and i actually coordinated um uh one of the immersive days in august in which i did this you know i kind of invited people to this panel which was like my dream panel uh, focusing on data and how to connect to that data and data that matters so we can kind of embody the planet. You know, that's kind of like my obsession. Uh, so I'm just so grateful. And of course, if you are a member of Immersa, you can watch this anytime uh, in the archives. And I hope that uh, you'll join us in the upcoming, in any of the upcoming Immersa days next year, um, which are looking very exciting. We're gonna have a summit in Montreal uh, later in the year. So that should be really, really exciting and super grateful that I can keep on doing things. <laughs> Mercy, things. Thank you, Julieta. And Kara, go ahead. Folks, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kara and I run the Novins Planetarium at the Jersey Shore. And I just wanted to share our tiny little bits of good news as well. We reopened in June standing demand, which was awesome and super overwhelming for the two of us that work here. Um, but it's been great. And we have seen an amazing amount of institutional support through this hard time, which has been really, really awesome for us. We are in the new year upgrading from D4 to D7, which is kind of a big jump. And we're very excited about it. And we're also getting some upgrades on our Zeiss and we got approved for an administrative staff member to help me answer the phones and do the rest of my job, which would be really, really awesome. <laughs> so I feel like the holidays came super early for us this year and so happy about that. Thanks. Phenomenal. All right, anyone else on the professional side we still have personal? <gasps> Noreen, I see you, I see the hand, go ahead. I could, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. So I figured I'd raise my hand. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> why not? Um, so this has been a kind of an exciting year for me because, uh, well, I've been involved in a lot of webinars. And um, I, actually, one, one week I presented three different um, talks at three different conferences on three different topics. So that was <laughs> that was kind of a, 
uh, a big thing for me, but also um, this year I was elected president elect of MAPS, which is very exciting. Um, I was honored to be um, nominated and I was super honored and surprised to be chosen. So um, thank you and uh, hopefully I'll make MAPS proud. We have um, a MAPS in-person conference coming up in May. Sean Latch is the host of that. And I'd like to ask Sean Latch to come on in and uh, talk about that because we're pretty excited about it. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, MAPS 2022 uh, is planned to be in-person here in Orono, Maine um, at our planetarium. We uh, our dates are the 18th through 21st, and we're going to be focusing on climate change and visualization. We're doing some work right now with uh, uh, direct, working with directly with uh, Carter Emmert and uh, Climate Reanalyzer, which is a pro uh, program here at um, our facility and from our Climate Change Institute to do some visualizations for that. And we're going to be showcasing some open space thing, open space and open source software. Uh, so also some bits with uh, Worldwide Telescope and other things of that nature. Um, there is the main mineral and gem museum just down the road from us, and we're planning a trip to it on Saturday, that Saturday of MAPS, where you will be able to, uh, attendees will be able to actually touch the moon, Mars, uh, Vesta, and several other uh, from, they have one of the largest meteorite collections in the United States, along with uh, numerous other minerals and gems. Um, so uh, that will be a portion of the conference too. Um, and we are working on, keep your fingers crossed, uh, to get Jessica Meir here, who is an astronaut from Maine, who was selected for the Artemis mission. And so we're hoping to have her um, and uh, we're working with our local Challenger Learning Center to see about bringing her here. So, um, so there should be a whole bunch of things and we hope you can come and join us. Uh, uh, sponsor information is already out, was sent out and is on the MAPS website um, as well. Hoping to have delegate packets out sometime in January, expecting a registration rate somewhere around 190 to 200 uh, at this point US dollars um, based on what I'm working out with all the budget bits and pieces. So, but if you wanna know more, give me a holler. Uh, you can just find me at sean.lotch at main.edu or planetarium at main.edu for more info. Fantastic. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you, Sean. Very much looking forward to MAPS this year. Uh, anyone else? We, we are uncharacteristically behind schedule, but that's because I'm like, Psh, we only need 30 minutes to recap 365 days. So uh, we'll, we'll jump right into... Our recurring segments, um, I remember thinking back to when we started these, this is an incredibly dumb way to fill time at an e-conference, and then somehow they all became incredibly popular. So without further ado, you're all ready for it. Back by just incredible demand, Anna Green and her long German words of the year. Dun, 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 dun. Hello. I hope you are all ready to play. Uh, if this is your first conference or the first time seeing this segment, the way it works is I am going to tell you a long German word because dear God, there's so many of them in the German language. Um, and then uh, I will give you two choices of what that word means. And you will have a poll and you will have to select which one you think is correct. Um, that being said, these words are slightly not so long as other long German words we've had in the past. I used up a lot of the really long ones already in 2020. It was necessary. Um, but this time around, I tried to go with useful long German words of the year uh, so that maybe you could possibly remember them and use them in 2024. So um, yeah, anyway, with that, uh, Michael, would you please bring up our first word? All right, so our first word is Die Geborenheit. Die Geborenheit. Is that the feeling of being snug, cozy, and safe? Or is that the state of no longer being in the womb, but not yet being totally born? What? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm the person who puts these in the polls, but I try to copy and paste quickly so I'm not 
Like, that there's at least some real reaction to it. And he doesn't know what the answers are either. I don't send the answers to Michael, so. So my joy at finding out the answer is real. It's a very real thing. So we've got about 80% of precincts reporting. Uh, looks like, oh, 70 to 30, the feeling of being snug, cozy, and safe. Anna, we're going to go in ahead. Oh, well, it's not really going to change all that much. Some of the stragglers are Googling or something. Uh, what is the correct answer? You're all catching on to my tricks after two years. Uh, yes, so that is the feeling of being snug, cozy, and safe. Something wonderful this time of year. Uh, if there was a language to have a word to describe the state of no longer being in the womb but not yet being totally bored, it would be German. Uh, I am not aware that there is actually a word for that, though. See, so you can all see the, the, the breakdown there. All right. Word number two. Let's go. The Torschluss panic. The Torschluss panic. Is this the fear of your favorite team losing the big game or the fear that time is running out? That is deeply existential. That, that, Speaking that of uh, Blues play Gloria, super stoked to be in town for a Blues game today. Not actually going because pandemic, but excited to be able to watch. So. All right, this one look, it, we've we've got again about eighty percent of everyone in. Uh, ninety, basically ninety to ten, the fear that time is running out. Anna. What is the correct Gotta answer? Gotta go back to longer words that aren't useful, apparently. Uh, these are too easy. Yes, uh, that is the fear of time running out. It literally translated, Tor is gate, Schluss is close, and panic is panic. So it's like gate closing panic. Bless the German language, truly. I love the literalness. It, it's wonderful. I and make then, a uh, Word number three, I will tell you, Anna, this is the word that uh, may be my favorite out of every word you've ever done for this bit. So here we go, word number three. Das Fingerspitzengefühl. Das Fingerspitzengefühl. Is that when a child makes a finger painting? Or is it when you have empathetic intuition or finesse? Fingerspitzen. Ooh, this one's, this one's, well, it was neck and neck, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of a little, um, I wouldn't say disappointed, but like, it's unfortunate we don't have Patty Seaton with us today. Oh, Just that, yeah. that, that German word joy that she's so good at. Uh, with 90% of votes in, looks like uh, about two thirds for when you have an, um, uh, an empathetic intuition or finesse against when a child makes a finger painting. Anna, what is the correct answer? So as you may have guessed, finger is finger, uh, spitzen are tips, and gefühl is feeling. So it is a fingertip feeling or when you have empathetic intuition or finesse. So you can like, if you were to say like, uh, that you you did something with fingerspits and gefühl, you could say like you finessed something is another way to use that word, which is totally different from saying that you have empathetic intuition, but why not? So uh, as always, uh, Anna will be posting these words to the event page. Uh, and then uh, when you arrive in Berlin for IPS 24, you will be given some registration information and a small quiz. And you must remember all of the words from long German words over the past two years. So uh, On that's that note, really what all this is about. I would like to ask, does anybody remember from last year? So a whole wide pandemic year ago, which is like 20 years. Does anybody remember not the German speakers, how to say Santa Claus in German? And you can give the English version, like the little English translation. Does anybody remember how to say Santa Claus? Is it just Sinterklaas? Um, I mean, I think that's more Dutch. 
Yeah, that oh, was my... Oh, yay, Mike. <laughs> That's great. Um, so in Germany, he is called Der Weimachsmann. Um, you can also call him Nikolaus, um, and typically when they talk about Nikolaus, that's the 6th of December when they leave their shoes out and you get chocolate in them, um, which is wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah, no, they, they call him the Bimax man, the Christmas man. The Christmas man comes on December 24th, and something I learned last year after our e-conference is that Santa comes on the 24th. You do not go to sleep and wake up the next morning and magically there's presents there because he came overnight. He comes while the children are still awake. Somebody, um, if you have children in the room, like earmuff them right now, just boarding. Um, so somebody, somebody dresses as Santa and shows up and like Santa comes and gives the gifts to the kids that night while they are awake, which kind of blew my mind. That was not where I thought that story was going but like the earmuffs. But then I realized, yeah, we don't want the kids to know about Santa. Yeah. Oh, so. uh, Anna, could you do us yeah. one last favor? It's not a long German word, but we would like some like on the spot translation. What would be a German translation for big man in a red suit? Big man in a red suit? Yeah. Großer Mann in ein, ein großer, oh, in einer rote Anzug. Don't quote me on those adjective endings. I am terrible with remembering the genders of words, and there's three in German. So you have feminine, masculine, and neuter. So I always get adjective endings wrong. It is the bane of my existence, but that's the general go of it. And I, I would believe that, Colin. I bet Welsh is super difficult, um, and admittedly part of why it's not on my list of languages to learn. Well, Anna, thank you so much for this, uh, 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 yet another eye-opening Long German Words of the Week. So Thank you uh, all for playing. As always. And now um, to that, that metropolis of culture, Richmond, Virginia, with Totally Bored, Justin Bartle. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, Richmond is a great city. Uh, and... Uh, I am happy to be here with you today. Um, I guess we did lose our internet yesterday and I was out this morning. So if I disappear suddenly, you know, that's what happened. Um, and another brief warning here before I start, um, get the slides up there for you. Um, if for uh, some reason, there's also a fire alarm that goes off uh, the next few minutes, a couple of hours ago, apparently one of my projectors was almost 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it looks fine. It's running again. We'll see what happens. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm here for Totally Bored. We're going to take a look at uh, some board games. Uh, if you caught the subtitle when it was up there briefly, um, things are starting to pick back up. So we're not quite as bored as we used to be. Um, so we're not playing quite as many games, but still have some updates for you. Um, we're going to start with uh, something that just kind of really shows how long we've been in this pandemic and how long all this have been, has been going on. Um, I think it might have been the very first e-conference, or at least the first uh, Totally Bored segment. Uh, somebody in the chat recommended Terraforming Mars, which I had never uh, uh, played before. I'd heard of it, but uh, we didn't have it. Uh, then they launched a Kickstarter for a new game in the terraforming Mars universe. <clears throat> so I backed that. Uh, it was successful. That's kind of where uh, things left off uh, last time uh, I spoke with you. And uh, yeah, it, it's been so long that a Kickstarter has actually gotten all the way to the end. I've actually got the reward. So uh, some quick updates on terraforming Mars. Ares Expedition. Um, if you are familiar with Terraforming Mars, uh, this game is similar, but also some important differences. Uh, it's a little bit smaller scale overall. Uh, it's, uh, it's card based, it's a world building game. And uh, instead of having multiple generations that, uh, that you move through, um, here it's just round based. Uh, every player up to four uh, selects what uh, what phase they would like to play in that round. Everyone resolves their uh, their phases simultaneously. Uh, a quick look at uh, what's inside the box for you here. You might have to zoom in on your screen a little bit, uh, but, but really well put together. You've got a little, uh, 
an old travel sized board if you've got the speaker view uh, maximized there. Uh, you've got player boards, which are pretty nice too. And uh, it's pretty tough to see in the pictures, but they're actually two layers. They're recessed. I'll hold here so you can zoom in on the video. All right, they're great. Uh, makes it easy to uh, track the, uh, uh, the little chits and things you have on there to uh, track your resources, your money, all that, that good stuff. Um, now, if you buy a copy for yourself, unless you already backed the Kickstarter and you've already got it, uh, the one thing you will not be able to get a copy of for yourself is the amazing Player Mats Kickstarter exclusive, the longest mouse pad you'll ever see. Uh, but those are really handy for, uh, for actually tracking uh, what's going on on your side of the board. Um, here's a view of one of our, our playthroughs, um, kind of like terraforming Mars. There's the planet that uh, that you're trying to turn from an inhospitable world to, uh, to some place with oceans and forests things like that. Uh, you run a corporation that uh, is building all kinds of horrible polluting industry on Mars, but hey, that'll, that'll warm it up. That'll make it nice for, uh, for humans to, uh, to live on. Uh, although I should uh, tip my hat to, I think, the, uh, the best card in the entire game, my, uh, my, my number one path to victory, space whales. I mean, any time you have a chance to, uh, to have space whales, I say go for it. Uh, this, uh, this one card single-handedly allow me to crush the opposition and uh, well, turn Mars into a nice habitable environment. Uh, so, uh, so that's Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition. Uh, if you do want to get a copy for yourself, it is available at Target. No, not the target of the DART mission, Dimorphos, the, uh, the, the moon of asteroid Didymos. Uh, that is, of course, just the retail conglomerate. Uh, head to Target, you can grab a copy of Ares Expedition for yourself. But hey, had to throw this image in there. Hashtag better known asteroid now available at online clothing retailers near you. Uh, finally, uh, one more quick update. Uh, it's another game that uh, I reviewed previously. It was pretty early on in this chain. I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewers at home to, uh, to find when I first reviewed. Um, the Search for Planet X, such a staple of our pandemic that was actually in the, the background image on my slides as well. But as the world has kind of started to change, um, we actually got to get together with some friends and have a full four player uh, uh, playthrough of the search for Planet X. Uh, we still found it. Uh, if you didn't see the, uh, the previous review, uh, this game is, is kind of a, a hybrid between a, uh, a traditional board game and uh, just something you'd play on your phone. There is an app that goes along with it that you have to have for the game to work. Uh, the basic mechanic is logic puzzles. Um, so uh, the, the sky is split up into different sectors and uh, there are comets, there are asteroids, there are dwarf plants, there are gas clouds. And you just get clues along the way, like uh, uh, you know, Planet X is, is opposite the sky uh, from one of the gas clouds or something like that. Uh, so you just get all these clues. Uh, you have to figure out where Planet X is, as the name of the game suggests. And uh, it was an instant hit with, uh, with us at home. When I just had uh, uh, our, our two players uh, in our apartment. Uh, but just a testament to how easy this game is to share with friends. Uh, as soon as we, uh, we took them through the, uh, the basic rules, uh, we got through a, a full search of the sky. We found Planet X. I was able to find it first, but uh, uh, the two brand new players also immediately uh, were able to, uh, to locate it as well and challenge me for a victory in this game as well. Uh, so if you want to track down Search for Planet X, that one is, uh, is just sold online, but, uh, uh, but find it everywhere online where fine board games are sold. And uh, that's, that's my games. No fire alarms. I think we're good. Thank you so much, Justin, for uh, another fantastic Totally Board. Uh, for those of you who maybe this is your first time in the e-conference or it's been a while, uh, the very first bit we ever did, the very first segment that we ever put together was somehow I was talking to this guy and I had seen his background far too many times. Just like, hey, Mike Smale, 
you should talk about records because that's entirely on brand. And a year and a half later, Mike Smale is still talking about records at Planetary Me conferences. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Smale. Thank you, Michael. Yes, this is the uh, the super sweet 16 episode of The Record Shop. So I, I thought about leaning into that, but I decided not to for the sake of uh, all 34 of you uh, in the Zoom room with us. Uh, my name is Mike Smale. And yeah, so for those of you who are new, uh, we basically take a few minutes to show off uh, a couple of records, things I'm listening to, things that are space related, things that I think you might enjoy. I'll share information on how you can uh, track them down yourselves. And um, Unintended topical bonus, uh, speaking about the thriving metropolis of Richmond, Virginia, uh, legendary Richmond hardcore band Avail just put out the first their first LP, Satiate. This has been out of print for like 15 years. Uh, and mine just showed up this morning at like six o'clock because the postal service is delivering things at crazy times of day now because it's that time of year. But uh, yeah, good music coming out of Richmond. Uh, but the ones... Um, the three records that we've got for you to talk about here today to actually go into a little bit more in depth on. We're going to start things off with uh, Big Bend. And this is where I try to again remember like it's been nine months. How do I hold things so they sit just right in the frame? Uh, Explosions in the Sky is a uh, an instrumental post rock band. So guitar, bass, drums, no vocals. They release uh, plenty of their own records, but they also do a lot of soundtrack work. Probably the one they're most known for is the Friday Night Lights movie soundtrack, and some of their songs also made it into the TV series. This is the soundtrack for a recent uh, NPR short about Big Bend National Park in uh, sort of West Texas, which is where the where the band is based out of. And the uh, the soundtrack work they do uh, still guitar, bass, and drums, but it tends to be a little a little softer, a little more experimental. They'll bring in some. Uh, some keys, some orchestral inf uh, instrumentation. And there's just a lot of fun things about this. So first off, uh, the cover, and I'm going to keep it tilted just so my ring light doesn't reflect. Uh, this is actually a, a piece of art known as 100 Moons. It's 100 photographs of the moon by an artist named Dan Klepper. So there's kind of a, you've got some sort of, you know, straight up dark sky ones. You've got some twilights. You've got some late afternoons. Uh, the record itself is a double LP. It's a nice gatefold jacket, beautiful picture of Big Bend National Park there on the inside. And then always part of the fun is what the record looks like itself. Uh, that comes in a couple different variants. Um, the one I got uh, was called Desert Rock. It was originally pictured as kind of a kind of a rocky tan sort of look. This one, it's a little bit hard to see. It's kind of a brown marble. There's a there's kind of some dark tan with some uh, with some black smoke in it. Uh, the past year and a half have been pretty terrible for the vinyl manufacturing industry. So there are lots of uh, things where things aren't coming up maybe exactly as they appeared, but that's okay because it's not how it looks, it's how it sounds and it sounds great. Uh, for those of you with independent record stores in your area, there's a, an indie record store variant that is a nice sky blue marble that I think is actually really sharp, pops really nicely. But that particular soundtrack again is nice. Uh, I would describe it. I mean, it's 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 not easy listening. Like it is easy to listen to. It is not like AM easy listening uh, music. Uh, but again, Explosions in the Sky, the big band soundtrack. Uh, so they they made the the original soundtrack was again for the NPR piece, and then they kind of built it out a little bit uh, and released it as a full fledged uh, record. Second record for today, also uh, what I would describe as uh, post rock. So again, guitar, bass, drums, no uh, no vocals. This one's maybe a little bit more typical of what you might expect to see in the post-rock genre. This is by a North Carolina trio known as Old Solar, and the release is called C. We zoom in on a little bit here. There's some uh, some very obvious sort of astronomical iconography here. We've got the sun. We've got some old some depictions of the moon and stars. You can get up really close. There's constellations. And then a very obvious sort of quadrant design here reflecting the seasons, summer or spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, it's maybe an old trope. I don't even know if like Vivaldi was the first person to do it, but the concept of uh, a, a musical suite around the seasons. Uh, I actually talked about another one during one of the earlier issues of, of the record shop, but this is uh, Old Solar doing the same. And again, the, the sort of uh, quasi medieval, faux new medieval, whatever you want to call it, uh, sort of artwork carries over throughout the piece. Uh, the vinyl itself also fun to look at. This is the, uh, the second pressing uh, it was out of, I think, 500 copies. It is a nice uh, gold with kind of a bright blue splatter. So fun to uh, fun to look at as well as to listen to. And what's uh, what's kind of cool about this, so it's, it's only five tracks. So there's the 
uh, one song for each of the seasons. And then there's sort of a, a final track called While the Earth Remains uh, that, that closes things up. But uh, because it's only five songs and, and they are, you know, eight to 10 minute songs, but it only takes, it's a double LP, but it only takes up three sides. So something that they, they did here, and we've seen this sort of thing before, is they did a nice screen printing on the, uh, on the D side and get a little bit tricky to see here. But so in addition to the splatter, you have, again, some of that celestial iconography uh, surviving, making its way through uh, to the D side of the record. Of course, you wouldn't actually play this. This side is totally just for, uh, just for looking at. But that is uh, C by Old Solar. Uh, this one is currently like totally out of print. So you have to go to the secondary market uh, to try to find copies of that. Uh, but you can also get the, uh, the digital copy. Uh, I always like to link to uh, band camps just because they tend to give artists uh, probably the most fair uh, cut of digital music royalties, digital music uh, proceeds. Uh, but then there's also, uh, there's uh, a label in the US called A Thousand Arms, a layer in Europe called Dunk that tend to put out their, their vinyl releases as well. All right, last but not least, our third choice uh, for, uh, third thing for today is called The Wave Epic. Uh, this was put together by Harun Mirza and Jack Jelfs, who were both art residents at CERN in the year 2018. So CERN has a kind of an in-house uh, artist residency. And these two put together this piece, The Wave Epic, which was uh, actually a short film and soundtrack. And the film is about, uh, it's set, a thousand years in the future. So I, I think most of us know what CERN is, the, you know, the, the super collider in Switzerland. And the, the idea was looking forward in time, a thousand years, humanity has moved on and people sort of discover the crumbling remains of, of CERN and these huge underground tunnels and caverns and weird machinery. And you know, what, what do they sort of make of all of it? Uh, the instrumentation, mostly electronic, uh, some interesting, interesting vocals, some sort of choral chanting, uh, some scientist vocals, which we'll talk about uh, more later. And some of the, the instrumentation was actually built out of old discarded computer hardware from, uh, from CERN, which is kind of cool. Uh, the Wave Epic was limited to 300 copies. Uh, the first 100 come hand numbered and autographed, and you can still get uh, numbered copies of this, uh, I believe. But uh, something that's kind of fun is that, because uh, they use the uh, sort of voiceovers from actual certain physicists on these tracks. So there's uh, folks like Rolf Landua, who we had, I think John Elvert bailed already, but he was one of our speakers at IPS 2012. Uh, Peter Jenny, uh, other scientists uh, provide some of the vocals on this as well. And then when it comes to the actual record, um, it's not actually a record. It's a giant paper disc uh, with again, sort of the, the Wave Epic logo on the other side and then a sort of glossy uh, CERN logo collision sort of evoking uh, design on it. And when you look this up online, they tell you this. They say this is not a vinyl record. Uh, they describe it as playable artwork. Uh, for the love of God, if you have a turntable, please do not try to play this because you will carve your needle right up and uh, cause more problems uh, than you will solve. But they do provide uh, downloads to all the about 30, 33, 35 minutes of music on the Wave Epic. Uh, it is, I would describe as kind of hard listening. It's not something I listen to all, the, all that often. It's, it's definitely uh, definitely an artwork, definitely an art piece. Uh, and I will share again the links to where you can get the audio here in uh, the chat. And then I will also, I should have copied this over earlier. Uh, they actually have the, the video piece that was put together is available on, uh, on YouTube and you can uh, watch that to your heart's content. Uh, in the future. So real quick here, let me again, getting back in the like, it's been nine months, how do we do this uh, phase of things? Let's share my screen. And there we have just our, our quick summation, uh, again, Explosions in the Sky, Big, ba Big Bend uh, soundtrack for National Public Television, uh, Old Solar, and the Harun Mirza, Jack Jelf's uh, compilation, The Wave Epic. Uh, all of these easily available uh, digital. Uh, the Big Bend LP, because that, that came out just a few months ago, uh, it's still readily available in, in record shops and online uh, through their Bandcamp, through their website. 
Uh, temporary residents, the record label also has some copies up, uh, but I didn't want to add too many URLs on there. Uh, then again, uh, Old Solo, you're going to have to go to the secondary market if you want to get a vinyl copy of. And then uh, the Wave Epic, still available through the uh, Mirza Jelfs Bandcamp uh, as well. So that's what I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find something that piques your interest. And who knows? Maybe we'll like do this again in another nine months. Who knows indeed. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and then our last official segment before Best Parts, uh, Pandemic primo podcast party for you planetarian everybody mary holt Woo! hello i think you got that out of order but that's totally fine um let me pull up my slides here like mike was saying it's been a minute since we have done this so give me just a second to share my screen don't mind the street sweeper that's going by here we go Boom. Can you see that? Yes. No? Yes. Good. Okay. You're all good. <clears throat> so everyone, welcome to today's version of PPP PFP, as I like to call it, uh, which is the Pandemic Primo Podcast Party for Your Planetarian, which I had hoped I would change the name of by now, but here we are. And I'm just here to tell you about some podcasts that I really like. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm starting out with what I like to call our tried and true faves, which are podcasts I've listened to for a very long time and they continue to be fantastic. So wait, wait, don't tell me. Many of you may be familiar with from the olden days of FM radio and AM radio and all the radio as you drive around listening to the radio. It's still on, it's still doing podcasts. It's amazing, you should listen to it. Here's a couple of the recent episodes. They're phenomenal. Wonderful is one that I started listening to, I think earlier this year. And it's about things that are wonderful. Pretty straightforward. All right. Next, we have just a few quick screenshots of the many, many different podcasts that I listen to. Now, you may be asking yourself, Mary, how do you listen to all these? The answer is, I don't. Do you see the little red numbers in the corner? Yeah, those are the ones I still have to listen to. Probably never will. Here we go. Uh, here are some new favorites that I've recently started. I just listened to uh, this episode of I Weigh. I haven't listened to this podcast at all, except for like three days ago. It, I can't even, I don't even have words. It was, it was, it's just really good. You should listen to these. They're, they're fantastic. And, uh, uh, the American Girls one, I just recently started because my sister recommended it to me. And uh, Maintenance Phase was recommended to me by another planetarian. They can reveal themselves if they feel so inclined. If not, whatever. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I will update these slides. Uh, I have these slides in the shared Glippa folder, if I'm not mistaken. And I've already began to edit the uh, presenter notes or whatever you call it. I will continue to do that so that you can inform yourself and have fun. So there you go. Thank you, Mary. You're very welcome. And uh, that brings us to uh, last part of our, our e-conference today. Uh, and of course, that is best parts. And that's where I get to turn it over to Renee. Renee, take it away. OK, this is a uh, very casual, but um... I have a culture uh, of asking everybody every day in my family, um, what was the best part of their day? It's a little bit better than asking, you know, how was your day? Because uh, you can usually get a little bit more of a detailed um, answer. And even on a hard day, there's got to be a bright spot. There's always the best part of every day. Um, and so we are, we started doing that with the e-conferences, talking about the best part of our week. Um, and so now that it's the end of 2022, uh, this is our chance to reflect. Oh no, it's, it's the end of 2021. Um, this is our chance to reflect on what maybe was a best part or the best part um, of your year. And so uh, you can just uh, raise your hand if you'd like, if there's anything you'd like to share. Um, and if you'd like to share your screen and share a picture, you're welcome to do so, although you certainly don't have to. So, does anyone have a? Oh, I see. 
make their hands that are raised? I thought they'd be like popping up. Oh, there we go. Thaddeus, go ahead. So I, I mentioned earlier, you know, getting this new position as planetarium director, and that was certainly a high mark after having been unemployed for a year and a half to then get uh, an utterly incredible job. But what I actually have to, I think, pick for my best moment is during the summer when after I got vaccinated, I got to travel to Wales and spend some time with my partner who I had been separated with also for over a year and a half. And that was incredible. Also, I wanted to go ahead and go first because I need to go uh, head off right now, but I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, I really enjoyed being able to participate in the conference and be here. And I look forward to uh, getting much more deeply involved with the whole planetarium community in the future. So also another highlight. Thank you, Thaddeus. Congratulations, I'm glad you got to take that trip. Okay. Bye. Anna. Okay, I'm gonna try and do this without crying because as we all know, I cry really easily. Um, so yeah, 2020 was particularly hard. Obviously we were all separated from loved ones, but being across an ocean and not being able to go home for Christmas and then my grandpa got Corona over Christmas as well and then cancer and like, it just, it's been very difficult. And so for me, the best part has been travel opening back up uh, for, for multiple things. Um, this sweet little one right here. Thank you for coming in frame. Um, I adopted a rescue pup out of Ukraine. She was supposed to come to me in November of 2020. And then December of 2020, she was supposed to be my Christmas present. Uh, and the borders between Ukraine and Poland closed because of Corona. And she wound up not being able to come to me until the end of February. Uh, so travel opening up allowed me to get my sweet little pandemic puppy. And um, then obviously the biggest thing for me was it gave me some hope to hold on to that once getting vaccinated, I was going to be able to go home and see my family. And so in November, I was able to, before Blippa, stop in and see my family for the first time in almost two years in, uh, for, for three short days, but it was worth, it was worth it. Absolutely worth it. Um, got to see my grandpa. He's doing good. Um, and my parents, of course. And then. Glippa was just an overwhelming, wonderful mess of emotions and love. And I knew how much I missed you all, but I didn't realize just how badly I missed you all <laughs> until I was there. Because you're family too. And now, now, I mean, I never would have thought in a million years over the last couple of years, that didn't make sense at all, but whatever, um, that I would not only get to come home again for, for Christmas and see my family and my aunts and uncles are all gonna be here, but also that I would get to bring my, my nervous little rescue dog with me as well. So we, we arrived two days ago. This was her first time flying and she did amazing. She is scared of wind blowing through the trees, but she slept through a 10 hour flight. She fell asleep during takeoff. So apparently airplanes are just fine and wind is scary, but don't care. She did great. She's absolutely loving St. Louis right now. I'm looking forward to taking her to Forest Park and just, she's, she's starting to get on great with my parents and it's, it's just, I didn't do it. I failed. So if y'all had bets, you won. Um, but yeah, um, just being able to travel and see everyone again has been the best thing for my heart and my mental state and physical state and everything. So um, I'm going to stop babbling now, but it, it was great to see you all. And I hope to see more of you in 2021. So, yeah. Yeah. Here's to hoping for a continued ability to travel so that we can all go see, um, your place. Yes. Get, get vaccinated. Germany requires vaccinations now. So get vaccinated and come visit if you weren't already. Uh, Colin. Yes, and as I was saying, travel, travel open up has probably been the highlight for us. I uh, managed to get, get up to my parents back in August after about 18 months without seeing them. But I also managed to get over to visit my brothers for the first time in three years in October. Uh, who He lives in Copenhagen, works at Malmo University in Sweden. And I managed to get over for the ceremony where he was made a professor at Malmo. So that, that was a definite highlight of, of the year. 
being able to just get away and actually see them and with about a week's notice, uh, uh, Sweden and Denmark opened up the borders just in time. So a bit of a scamper around, but it was it was really good to see them for, for about a week. So uh, as I say, tra traveling, the vaccination is really opening things up and let's hope it continues, Omicron permitting. It sounds lovely, um, Adam. Thank you. Um, my mine is not as uh, special and personal as the ones before. But Anna, what is the name of your puppy, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, her name is Lelaps, uh, and Lelaps in Greek mythology is the dog that was given by the goddess Diana to the to a queen whose name I can't remember, but it was some really difficult Greek name, um, and. It was the dog that could catch anything it was set to hunt. And this queen had the dog set to hunt the fox that could not be caught. And this caused the paradox that made Zeus angry, um, which I feel he doesn't have the right to be angry about anything, given all the problems he causes, but whatever. And so to end the paradox, he took Lelaps and placed Lelaps in the sky as Canis Major, the big dog, and the fox became Canis Minor, the little dog, despite the fact that there is a constellation of the fox. So... But anyway, so she's the smallest dog I've ever had. My last dog was a full-sized German Shepherd, but um, my Canis Major is my little dog. So she That's thinks so she's nice. a big dog. <laughs> and, and quite a cutie too she is. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so if you, if you really know me out there, I'm, I am kind of a super high-tech Luddite. Uh, you know, at work, a lot of tech, at home, rotary phones, <laughs> but um, Robin pestered enough for years, so I got a cell phone. So there you are. There, and so I know, look at that. It's amazing. But uh, anyway, so with that, I also like to do little projects. And so I made this we're still focused on Anna's video but on oh, there you go it's a cell phone holder I'm trying to do it right there you go so you can see what it is but it's actually sorry hang on one second one second um let me turn off the background filter there you go. Okay, so now you can see it. So it's like a puzzle piece, and it goes together like that. And so you can run a cable through, and the angle was very difficult. You had to be the right angle, so it faced you correctly off the desk. So I made this. I made a bunch of these for guests this year for family and some uh, fellow staff and the interns. So that's all I have. That's great. I love handmade gifts. Uh, Jackie. Well, I guess, I guess mine is like professional, I guess, but like, you know, I am now the, uh, um, Glippa, uh, crap. I can't remember what I'm doing. Uh, uh, publications chair. I'm the publications chair for GLPA. And like, I also got a fellowship award at the recent one and it's like I have like ever since like the my very first GLPA Glipa, I I always like you know was so envious of everyone who got awards and I'm like you know one day one day I'm going to you know I hopefully one day I can be able to contribute and I can get it and I I did it's it was a really big deal for me and I just I just, I just, I love GLPA so much and I, they want me to, they want me to lead there and it's just, I just feel so special. So that's it. So I, you know, that's, that's about it. <laughs> well, we're glad we're, as a member of GLIPA, Jackie, I'm, I'm glad to have you there and meeting at GLIPA. Uh, Ken, I see your hand is raised. 
<clears throat> uh, this spring, I became a grandfather twice over. <clears throat> and of course, obviously, nine month old grandchildren, Christmas time, it's going to be, it is a blast. They're a lot, they're so much more fun than I could imagine. You know, they're, they're great. And now they're both crawling and they're fast. They're really fast. <clears throat> like over the holiday break, I'm going to get back in your shape just chasing those suckers down, man. No, you can't touch that rock. It's blue. It's poisonous. No, <laughs> you know, et cetera. You get the drill. In a, in a house full of rocks and minerals, yes, that's going to happen. The other thing, but the most important thing about all of that, forget the kids for a minute, they're mothers. Watching my daughters evolve into caring and wonderful parents is something, if you haven't experienced it yet as a parent, you know, you will, hopefully, one day, and it is the finest feeling on the earth because you feel like, you know, there's a meme on Facebook about, you know, the world is mean and cruel and vile. But, you know, I'm going to raise kids that care. And that's going to be our answer to that. You know, it's, it's um, a little better than I'm doing it, but you get the idea. And so I, I am filled with hope now. You know, we may actually work our way out of this mess, all of them. So that's all for me. Uh, well, I don't see any other hands raised uh, right now. But, oh, Jack, Jack, go ahead. There we go. <laughs> well, being retired, but still obviously being married to a planetarian uh, was really cool. We did actually get to have an in-person um, meeting of the Carolina planetariums uh, <clears throat> up in North Carolina. Uh, we've been able to get together. We're all vaccinated. And uh, so we've had some really nice get togethers. But uh, actually, one of the things that I wanted to mention that I feel really proud about is I, I have uh, <clears throat> been part of the IPS. It is now called the International Development Committee, uh, like helping people across the world to to learn more about uh, science and, and space and so on. And uh, through that, um, uh, Susan Owen, who's in uh, Kenya, uh, <clears throat> uh, knew someone and another friend of mine knew this person. So we, uh, I, this isn't even IPS, but we uh, have been helping. There's a uh, woman in Pakistan who has been teaching students about uh, space and so on. She was not even able to uh, go into that profession. She, you know, your parents pick what you have to do. So she's a medical tech, but she's been doing stuff with students. And uh, I was able to help arrange an astronaut friend of mine. We did a thing with her students. And let me see if I can pull this up. And let's see if you can see this. And that's what we're proud of. Uh, um, Yumna's uh, 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 kids, she's trying to lead them into science and STEM and so on. And she was inspired because when she was in elementary school, her teacher told her space does not exist. Think about that <laughs> and trying to overcome that. So um, I think you look at those faces and hope that those people will <clears throat> learn uh, more about science for the future. So anyway, <clears throat> that's, that's what I in, enjoyed. And, uh, 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 and like I said, Martin George has done an excellent job now of getting us together with the uh, uh, planetarium uh, group for international and we're, we're having an interesting time. Zoom actually is helpful. Well, go ahead. If you haven't had a chance to share and you'd like to, just uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, I'll take a moment to share uh, my best part, which is almost always my kids. So like uh, Ken was talking about and some other some others who have uh, kids, if that's what, you know, you're, not everybody needs to have kids. But if you have kids, they can be a delightful part of your life. Um, and I have a four-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And, a half year old, and uh, my four-year-old, uh, started kindergarten pre-k this year 
And um, that has been a lovely addition to our family routine because um, she would always stayed at home before my husband. She didn't go to daycare. Um, and so seeing her grow and develop and like make friends <laughs> uh, after having spent a lot of time at home without a lot of interaction with other kids um, in the previous year uh, has been really lovely uh, for all of us. And um, Stella has started to like to make crafts with me at night and I really enjoy making things. So getting to make things with my kid is uh, really fun and sweet. We are making a gingerbread a train right now at night. <laughs> um, and then my daughter, Rosemary, is just starting to say words. Uh, so um, throughout all the up and ups and downs of the year, uh, being able to come home to my, um, my kids and husband. We are, we are five minutes over the hour, so I'm not going to close it out. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, unless uh, there's anybody else you need to share about. Awesome. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you to everyone. We got two weeks here in the for the rest of the year, and 21, it, we're bringing it to a close, and we've got hope, I think. I think we all do for 22, and let's just uh, keep the momentum going and looking forward to seeing you all in the, uh, in the new year. So happy holidays. Happy end of December, if you're not a holiday person. Uh, enjoy the new year, um, and uh, let's do it all again soon. <laughs>